Ahojte, moji milí druháci, vítam vás na ďalšej hodine. A pre druhú D je to posledná marcová hodina a pred veľkonočná a pre B a C je to 1. aprílová hodina a po veľkonočná. Takže ja vám takto dopredu alebo aj a, už spätne a, prajem príjemné sviatky. Dúfam, že ste si oddychli. No a ste asi uprostred práce s dejpisom. Dobre, my poďme na dnešnú tému, ktorú máme. And the topic for today is actually romance. Uh, this is a picture from that I uploaded for my class for 1B because they got this UHV Introduction to Humanities lesson and they had some really great stuff with creating their own costumes during the lesson with Mr. Winter. So I uploaded something like this. Uh, Romans. Yeah, but we had it. We have already had it, uh, hadn't we? So I believe, yes, we of course did. But if you remember, we studied this presentation and empires of early Middle Ages with Arabic Caliphate and Islam, for which, of course, like uh, previous lesson, even today, you're supposed to respond some question. I don't know what question uh, I gave it to you. So... Um, just re keep responding while I am still talking. The topic we are going to deal with today is uh, actually Eastern Roman Empire, uh, which survived in uh, uh, during the medieval times and its Byzantine Empire. This is another name that uh, they didn't call them, they didn't call it like uh, this name, but we call it just to make it like more simple and to understand it, make it different from Eastern Roman Empire, because this is the name that we use. Okay, I believe the presentation will be visible with all the pictures, because it's really like wider angle, so let's move on. It's actually pretty uh, possible that uh, if I'll be brief enough and not talking as always, as usually, so we can move also to Frankish Empire and if a uh, surprise would happen may happen so i will finish also frankia so let's start with this and with byzantine empire okay the flag in here is actually among the among your tasks in your assignment don't forget to mention it but i can tell you this is not the correct one this is one of many that are around because just like many of these empires they didn't have this vexillological uh, vexillological uh, rules like in heraldry even this came like much later and they were, you, they were using many flags and this is that i enjoyed because it contains like uh, symbols of uh, of the empire like double-headed eagle uh, with some greek style crosses with some greek alphabet and hero which is uh, if you remember this greek roman uh, sign of uh, of um, symbol of christianity which was in here okay so byzantine empire uh, so look for uh, search for another flag that may be more historically accurate, not like this one. This is just for illustration. So Byzantine Empire is the, the name of the empire as we call it, as we know, uh, as we uh, give it a name. So uh, as you can see, it uh, still existed in 476 AD, which is the year of the fall of Western Roman Empire, and uh, lasted for almost 1,000 years. From their point of view, from Byzantines. Uh, they had been there before and it was actually like gradual development of Roman Empire since the times of establishment of Rome and at least since the conquest of Greek-speaking provinces of uh, for Roman uh, late Republic and early Empire of uh, uh, of the first and second triumvirate. Okay, but this was something different. So what was it like? So this Greek uh, or eastern part of Roman Empire, uh, contemporary uh, is Greece, of course, with uh, Balkans at that time, and also Anatolia, contemporary current uh, Republic of Turkey, and later on, uh, for a while, for a couple of centuries, even with the Middle East and North Africa and surroundings. Uh, since 395, you know that there was... Uh, a new capital town even before that, like uh, beginning of the 4th century in times of Con uh, Emperor Constantine, who built brand new capital city called in Greek Constantinopolis or Constantinople. And uh, uh, as there was new capital town of Roman Empire, so since 395 AD, uh, the empire was divided in the western part and to eastern part. And uh, because you know that in 476, uh, the Western Rome in Ravenna actually fell under attacks of uh, Odoacir of the Ostrogoths, 
Uh, so these guys, this Eastern Roman Empire, this Eastern part remained actually the heir, the successor of uh, Romans. So even they themselves called themselves Romanoi. Romanoi, it is in Greek language and it means Romans. So this is something like we call ourselves like Niemcy, Franco, Habsburgozi, Rakushania. It's Slovak word but used for like previous uh, previous story. Okay, somebody's using Microsoft Teams, so sorry for the sorry for that. Uh, okay, so uh, let's move on. Let's move to the next slide. So what was it like? Okay, I had a couple of pictures, didn't check, uh, or maybe I did, I don't know. So what is there? What was this empire like? As you can see, we have some emperor in here with some officers and bodyguards and also some military stuff, like, but not very ancient. Like, So this is something that we have already uh, Middle Ages. So Constantinople was the capital city, as you've seen. Actually, it has an, another names because uh, it had been there before. It was not just like brand new place. It was still excellent place. And for millennia, there was a Greek small town or a village with some fishermen living there. That was called Byzantion. Byzantion, and that is also the name. How later on, uh, many. Uh, historians, writers, uh, chronicle writers, how they mentioned that this Byzantine Empire, so, or Byzantine Romans, okay, I need to close this, uh, close this lesson, so this was the thing that, uh, uh, this was a name of, actually, of a village that gave name to New Way, or uh, New Roman Empire, that was different a bit. Uh, there were many Slavs uh, interacting during the history of Byzantine Empire, and our ancestors start to call it, like, a very nice name, uh, Tsarigrad, or Tsarigrad, which is, like, the castle or the the town of Tsar, which is actually shortage for Caesar. If you remember the Caesar and Tsar and Caesar, it is similar like we will deal with King of Francia called Karol, Karolus, Karol Mount, Karol Magnus, Karol Magnus, and Kral came from this word. So this was Tsarihrad is an, like the, the castle or town of the emperor of Tsar. So interesting names, Constantinopolis, and today it's called Istanbul, that we'll come to that point. Still, it was found by uh, the Emperor Constant Bosporus Trace, which was excellent strategic position, and actually it helped also Byzantines to survive for such a long period, so long, such a long period, because it was really big ones. Okay, let's move on. Okay, I got stuck for a while, I don't know why. Okay, it works again. So the ethnicity, this is more complicated, even for me, it took me like uh, many years to study who Byzantines actually were, because, you know, they are they're Greeks. Today we can hardly imagine that uh, there were more Greeks living in surrounding territories, because today there are no Greeks in Turkey anymore, like almost no Turk, uh, Greeks there. So, but at the time there were many Greeks living uh, actually in the coast of uh, of Asia Minor, so there were many of them. Still, there were many Armenians, much larger territories. If I could give you, to if I could show you ethnic map of medieval Byzantine Empire, that would be really interesting and very different. What was the reason? Because it was still before arrival of Turks and uh, Armenians, for example, or Greeks had excellent. Uh, environment to live and spread a language and religion within the uh, Roman and all this Byzantine Empire. So just like uh, Greeks, even Armenians were living much more in the inlands of contemporary Turkey, also like around like now the city, the capital city of Turkey around Ankara. Jews were the other guys. Uh, Hebrew speaking Jews, of course, spread it in the times of Roman Empire, and they uh, many of them were living in southern parts of uh, Anatolia. So again brand new place, maybe brand new information for many people. Arabs, of course, Arabs were living like pretty nearby, Syria, Assyria, but their language was actually spread with the spread of Islamic and Arabic caliphate. And uh, especially since those times, many Arabs settled down in Byzantine Empire, were living there actually, or had been living there before in case of Palestine, Jordan, uh, part of Mesopotamia, that's Iraq or Syria. So there were lands uh, that were, these were like original population of. And later on, during this great migration, a lot of Slavic people settled down in the Balkans, crossed these Byzantine borders, and settled down in such large numbers 
that they overwhelmed and assimilated original Greek or Dacian or Illyrian, Illyric uh, population. That was case of Croatia, of Serbia, of Bosnia and Herzegovina, Montenegro, Macedonia, or Northern Macedonia today, and Bulgaria. And these states actually will be fighting against Byzantines. And what is interesting, even uh, Constantine and Methodius were from like this ethnically mixed family of Slavic and Greek Byzantines. So interesting, of course many other nationalities were there, but it's very difficult to track them. One important feature of Byzantine Empire that is really for one of few long-term effects or impacts of this empire was their faith, their religion. Uh, you may know the specific de depiction of uh, Jesus or Virgin Mary with uh, baby Jesus with Greek letters. And you may know maybe from Eastern Slovakia or from Ukraine, Romania or from Greece and so-called icons de depicting actually way of Eastern Orthodox Church. The religion, of course, uh, had been different before and it was this Roman... I, I don't like this word paganism because uh, it's actually point of view of later on Christians, which is not very correct because it was, they were not pagans like people who didn't understand who the, are the gods. They were just picking up the gods they believed and for them it was real religion, actually much older for the time than uh, Christianity. Still, we know that Christianity was tolerated since the Edict of Milan in 313 AD and by, the, by this 375-380, it was actually proclaimed as the official and only one official state religion. So it took them, it took Christians about like three centuries when they overwhelmed, overwhelmed and dominated around the empire and actually pushed forced these organizations, the church, pushed the emperors to accept it, both in West and both in East Roman Empire. Of course, logically, in the West there was this Latin Christianity that we today called Roman Catholic with their own head of religion, who is the Pope today. And they spread it within Western and partially Central Europe. But here, these guys, they didn't need any of this Evangelium written in Latin. They could speak Hebrew, many of them, Aramaic, but especially they had Greek Evangelium too. So for that reason, for that reason, uh, the state religion uh, within Byzantine Empire after the division was only in this Greek form, only one Evangelion. There were a couple of differences in theology, different dogmas. So for that reason, immediately after the division of the, the empire and thus division of the church, there were some of disagreements and even there were councils held, I mean meetings of big, of high clergy, of bishops, archbishops, at the time not very powerful, but still spreading their religion. So there were actually a lot of animosity among them. They didn't like each other very much and a lot of conflicts even later on caused that they actually were separated. Final separation and division, I would call it even divorce, of Christian church in this case because actually there had been many other Christian churches like in Armenia and Ethiopia Zoroastrianism in Persia and so on but final division of these big main dominant churches uh, happened in 1054 that is called the Great Schism Schismos in Greek it means division like clash and division like Roskol Východny Roskol Velka Schisma an Englishman, that is Eastern Orthodox Church of Byzantine Empire, of Eastern Roman Empire, was separated from Western Roman Catholic Church, the Great Schism. Let's, expl let, let's explain what happened. Firstly, uh, these Byzantines or Greeks were reading their own Evangelium and they didn't change anything. So what they... Uh, served in the masses, in the churches, where they were speaking about Easter, about divinity of Jesus, about virginity of Virgin Mary, about marriages of the priests, called so-called popes. So they didn't, they didn't change anything. So that for that reason, they start to call their own church, their own ecclesia, they start to call orthodoxos. Orthodoxos in Greek, it means original, true, which is původna. So, so this is interesting that for many people who are in our Western uh, cultural sphere, geographical sphere, uh, this may be very different, but these guys, 
They claimed they didn't change anything, and for that reason they called themselves true, the original, ta prava viera, povodna. For that reason, this also start to be called in Slavic languages pravoslavna viera, pravoslavie, prave slovo, prave oslovanje boa. We didn't change anything. If you think that the, in the West they didn't change anything, it's not true because there were many councils held that new and new dogmas were being inter, uh, introduced and uh, they, were st- they became actually part of so-called Roman Catholic Church. Roman Catholic, why? Because it was not in Constantinople, it was in Rome where the Pope, Papa, the father of Western Latin uh, church was present. Still they start to call it, to make it different for Orthodox, they start to use Latin word called Catholicos or Catholicus. Catholicus means universal, general, uh, which means that probably they want it to be for everybody and for that reason they are adopting many things that hadn't been uh, in the Bible, they were not present, but they uh, found it useful for their uh, theology. For example, there were many these pagan uh, festivals or pagan dogmas that they just adopted and proclaim it as a part of it. For example, Holy Trinity. This is something that is not present in Eastern Orthodox Church, but they created that we need something to replace three as a magical number of God Jupiter, of God uh, Odin, of uh, of uh, three-headed, uh, three-faced, uh, got Triglav or Svantovit among Slavic people. They needed to replace, for example, uh, winter solstice celebration. So they invented Christmas. They needed to replace pagan great festival of spring, which was Easter. Actually, this is from Anglo-Saxon word Ostra, which was celebration of all gods and arrival of spring. Why there are different dates of birth of Jesus and his death crucifixion? You know, because there was lunar calendar that they used it according for the for the planting uh, planting seeds. You know. In in, uh, in the spring, for example, and many traditions like Easter eggs and uh, whipping and splashing that we know were actually from pagan Slavic times, for example. So just like with Halloween, which was uh, original pagan celebration and uh, like remembering the past away members of your family and praying to the to their souls, uh, becoming like All Saints Day, for example. And this was not present in this Eastern Orthodox Church. We made them very angry and arguing and so one and gradually all the conflicts came into the climax that uh, just like there was Pope, father uh, of the church in Rome, of this Latin Roman Catholic Church, so also the head of Eastern Orthodox Church in Constantinople was Patriarchos. Patriarchos in Greek it means father, the same. So two fathers, Papa and Patriarchos, were fighting, you know, each other, uh, but I don't mean in military, but when they start to argue about some of these dogmas, so they just send the letters, and when you are when you are fed up with somebody over the Facebook, uh, you can go to Twitter or whatever. Uh, but probably <laughs> you rather I would rather block this person. You know, I send him like go away. You know, uh, and this is called uh, this is called when you banish uh, somebody from the church. It means X. Communication, excommunicatia cirque is known as vilucheni cirque, and this is interesting fact that uh, when the Pope in Rome sent letter of excommunication to the Patriarch of, of Orthodox Church, he also immediately sent him the letter of uh, <laughs> of excommunication. So I excommunicate you. No, I do excommunicate you from the church. So that was interesting, but actually that was official great so-called Eastern schism because later on in 500 years there would be another dissolution of Western Church and that was between Catholic and Protestant. So that's why in for especially Western historiography they have Eastern Great Schism, this one, and then Western Schism. And that's Martin Luther's Reformation, Evangelicals, Protestants, Calvinists versus Roman Catholics, which were changing again. So as you can see many of the things were uh, from Roman times, like mosaics and traditions and togas, but some of them brand new, uh, just like with Christian faith uh, and new Orthodox government. Okay, I was speaking really a lot, and one part of this picture is uh, is actually the immediately the greatest and the most famous emperor that I want you to remember because it was really important. His name was Justinian or Justinian. Justinian the Great, Justinian the Great, uh, living in uh, actually not for so long concerning like this impact in uh, the middle of the uh, 6th century 
uh, actually in very bad year this year 555 AD 555 AD was the years when uh, Byzantine Empire under his rule of the rule of Justinian uh, made the greatest furthest territorial extent actually he tried to restore empire as it had been before and they had many reforms in the military I added some videos and links to videos about their uh, medieval warfare and actually, uh, his generals, Belisar and the Narzes, or Belisarius and Narzes, they conquered Balkans, they pushed uh, uh, some Visigoths and Gapids back, later Slavic came, and Middle East and the Southern Apennine Peninsula, Northern Africa, and actually even Italian uh, Peninsula. When they conquered Rome and Ravenna, so Justinian could really feel like, like the guy who restored uh, the the whole Roman Empire, of course, without Gallia, Hispania, and Britannia, and or Pannonia, for example, they had its plans. What happened was that in year 555, series of catastrophes happened all around the Europe and Africa and the world. And uh, if you like Google, like the worst year in the history, this would be the worst. If you think that this we're living bad years, definitely not. Much more terrible epidemic of plague, uh, stroke the empire. There were volcanic eruptions covering skies with ashes, uh, destroying agriculture all around. There were invasions of further barbaric tribes, including Slavic peoples, and many, many other catastrophes. Earthquakes were happening, tsunami waves, and so on. So probably this also caused that Justinian couldn't fulfill his dream of restoring this empire back to the previous form and to previous territories. What he managed to do was that he managed finish that he managed to finish the building of the biggest building of those times and thus also the biggest Christian temple of the world. Building of so called Hagia Sophia, the temple of the divine wisdom, Hram Bože Mudrosti, was started by Constantine the, the Great, and it was finished by Justinian Great within two hundred years, which was pretty fast. And concerning that we have this excellent Roman architecture and technologies. Byzantines used them the same. So then we have one of the biggest temples that only bigger one uh, became like later when uh, Basilica of St. Peter and Paul in Rome was finished. And it was like Renaissance period, like uh, 1,000 years later. For 1,000 years, this was the biggest Christian temple. As you can see, not Christian anymore because of minarets in here. And instead of crosses, there was, of course, a, a sickle with a star. Because uh, after the conquest of Byzantine Empire by Ottomans, uh, they changed it from a Christian church, Orthodox church, to Muslim mosque, which it was the biggest. During the 20th century, it was just a museum. And... Uh, 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 later on, a year ago, I think the Turkish president Erdogan uh, claimed that they are going to restore these uh, prayings and it will be mosque again. Okay, so probably you've been, some of you have been to Istanbul, so you saw it, but one of the oldest standing buildings with this fully, and it's, I, I think it's really a miracle that it's still standing. The other miracle were uh, from Hagia Sophia, were also the fortification, you'll see them too, and the other was uh, Roman law. If you remember, uh, when we were talking about the effects of Romans, so I mentioned that Roman law was one of the things that we use today and we should be really grateful for that and happy. And the one who really preserved it and actually took it from Romans and move it to Middle Ages for medieval towns, cities, and states, and early modern states was this guy, Justinian the Great. His dream was really about this restoring the empire with everything, not only in territory, but also with a system of law, system of administration. And what is administration? Administration is apply application of law. This is what Okresna Uradi, district offices, what ministries are doing. There is a law created by Senate. In this case, there was no Senate. There was the emperor. But he issues, like, uh, he passed law, an act, zakon. And then all the officers, all the administration and army and military, they have to make sure, they have to ensure that this law is brought into the practice, that everybody, every citizens, uh, every citizen have right to read it, 
or maybe to use it, you know, and trials and juries and, and courts and so on. So they have some rights and protection of individuals, which is interesting because we are at the beginning of early model, uh, early uh, mid medieval times, and still there was actually slavery present, even in Byzantine Empire. Arabs and even Slavic or Frankish merchants were traded with a lot of slaves in here. So, but this is something. What he did, he summoned these 12 tables, uh, Legis de Odecim Tabularum, so these uh, laws of 12 tables and he asked his lawyers and uh, to summon all the cases that probably happened in the times of Roman Empire, Republican Empire and summon them as examples, as precedences and summon them in these huge books of Corpus Juris Civilis a big surprise is not written in Greek, but he also wanted to restore Latin language. And for that, it was commonly used. It was fr lingua franca. It means communication language, like English today. So that's why they summon it. And Corpus Juris Civilis are huge books, or 12 books about law, but really thick ones. It's not like tables. And if you decide to study law... Of course, apart from history, they need you to, they ask you to, to be a great historian because you have good memory. You can remember a lot. And especially Roman law, that one of the school, the university subject for studying law, is actually analyzing, reading this Corpus Juris Civilis. So this is something different and something that Byzantines really preserved from Roman times uh, till they, these days. Okay, uh, let's go through the history of Byzantine Empire, which is full of warfare. You know, having excellent like Greek and Turkish like coves and connecting two great uh, seas of Black and uh, Mediterranean Sea, and also uh, being like in the middle of trade routes from Scandinavia across Russia to Africa to Egypt. You have Egypt, you have Middle East, access to Indian Ocean. You have like you are at the end of the Silk Road from China. Okay, so this gives you excellent possibilities, but even you are excellent target for all nations and tribes and tribal unions and alliances all elsewhere. So between the 7th after the fall of uh, Justinian's rule and uh, restoring, so Byzantine Empire had to defend and they successfully defended against attacks of Slavic people invading these lands since like the 6th and 7th century. Uh, then since the 6th and 7th century also Avars and until the 8th century, beginning of the 8th century. We'll talk about both of these nations and eventually of course against Arabs because they're just spreading uh, their uh, their faith, uh, Islam, you know. And actually Arabs were successful in uh, Middle East so maybe this successfully is not very correct because they lost Egypt, they lost lost uh, Palestine, Israel, Jordan, Syria, and partially Mesopotamia. So this is how these borders were set for a while. You will see a couple of maps. Uh, what else? All these invasions had one uh, common feature that these uh, tribes were coming in such large numbers that Byzantine Empire didn't challenge them in the battlefield. They rather withdrew hid in the towns over the fortifications and especially over the fortifications of Constantinople that had like huge fortification really thick walls uh, that no army could break for, for 1,000 years. And one of possibilities how to attack them from this weak uh, pass was to attack uh, from seas. I will go back to show you this this picture. Because this is town, if you're able to see the cursor, uh, you see that the, this is the peninsula called Golden Horn, uh, Zlatirog, and also the bay is called Golden Horn. The thickest uh, fortification was from lands, of course, but then even the ports in here were fortified. Actually, the, the easiest, uh, the softest wall, the smallest walls were uh, along the coast of this Golden Horn. The reason was that if you want to sail in here, so there were two towers and from each tower to another there was a huge chain pulled and it was under the sea, but there was mechanism that when some enemy ships were uh, approaching, so they start to lift this chain from the sea and about like two, one meter above the sea level, which was like obstacle destroying all the ships in here, so preventing from sailing inland. 
and only one army managed to break it. Actually, later on, and they destroyed it with the Crusaders in the th uh, 13th century and so. But at that time, Avars or Slavic people, with maybe some again Russians with Vikings invading uh, invading empire in here with many ships. But the same with Arabs, they didn't have chance didn't find a way how to break this chain and to attack. So every time when Byzantine uh, navy clashed with uh, their enemies, so they uh, start to use like uh, their super gun, super weapon, super secret weapon that is called the Greek fire. Probably it was kind of mixture of oil, of nafta, that is Arabic word for that, and uh, of maybe some alcohols, and it was kept in a in a big bowl that was being like uh, kept in like high temperature, uh, so it was really easy to spray it, you know, with kind of a pump. So just these Byzantine galeras uh, battleships were aiming at the enemies, and when they lit a fire and they were spraying this like a flamethrower on the enemy ship. So this Greek fire was like super weapon and for even for that reason Byzantines were supposed to be like technologically cult like the most powerful empire of early Middle Ages that even Arabs couldn't break this power. So you can still see Hagia Sophia with El Minaret's battle. This is a really good picture and this is like depiction of course with Greek description of Greek fire. It was kind of big enigma, a mystery how to make this this liquid. Okay, what else? 8th century was interesting because uh, Byzantines experienced period of something that I told you about Islam, the previous lesson, that in, in Islam it is forbidden to depict faces of a prophet, of a god, of archangels, because they suppose that no human is so perfect to depict their faces without not insulting them, without insulting them. So for that reason, uh, also various ideas came even to Eastern Orthodox Church and the climax was in this 8th century in the period of iconoclasm. Clasm, Clasmos is destruction in, uh, in uh, Greece and icon is actually icona, icon is the picture, the portrait of Jesus a portrait of Virgin Mary. So icons usually were uh, the, um, drawn on a wooden plate, just like today in Eastern Slovakia, and they were illuminated uh, or ornamented with some gold and uh, typical, typical colors. But still, like weird um, style, for many it was like offensive. So they start to use it from Islam, this Muslim attitude, like it would be better not to depict anything. And imagine that Hagia Sophia and temples and even in Ravenna had this beautiful Roman and Byzantine mosaics with many of uh, faces of not only of emperors, of apostles, of Jesus and so on. But during this period in Byzantine Empire they were banned. So all forms of religious imagery were uh, banned. So as in this picture they are just pulling down with the axes all these wooden altars, these icons and they some of them are being burned and they are thrown to the river. And this is actually a picture depicting that some of the icons were saved by a miracle that the god like lifted them and he took them to heaven, you know, because it didn't last for a long time, but many of the precious things were destroyed. So typical iconoclastic uh, church of Byzantine Empire was this one, uh, looked like this. So only like simple cross, if any, remains of some paintings, but that's all. And also what I saw... Uh, from this old stuff in Turkey, really that was they were without any of these beautiful decorations. The only one that survived was Hagia Sophia, and with so beautiful, so beautiful depiction like in this with this Hagia Sophia, uh, is that they left only ornaments, only in some small places that they couldn't get to. So even Turks decide so let it be. This is really cool because there is this. Uh, Justinian the Great, we used even this Byzantine law, why not? And a couple of faces remain there, but only like hidden ones. So you see destruction of uh, of this is interesting. Okay, maybe I should move it to other place, yeah, like this. Okay, so you can see it in better depiction. Hagia Sophia and here is so interesting place. Okay, I mentioned in previous slide, I didn't mention the main enemy for a period of early Middle Ages for Byzantines, that was Bulgaria. You know, Bulgaria today, 
like a very small country, bigger than Slovakia, but not so big. But at that time, it was really big empire, spreading from not only in Bulgaria, but also in Romania, in Serbia, northern Macedonia, going down even to Greece. And uh, in the times, <clears throat> sorry, at the times of the 9th century of Great Moravia, they expanded, look at this, almost to the borders of Slovakia. And Great Moravia, during the times of Prince Svetopluk, so they had actually a couple of battles or conflicts against Bulgaria. So their power was really great. Uh, just like many other countries, it was like mixed. It was established, founded by nomadic, Turkic, maybe tribe or kind of Magyar tribe called Bulgars. But they were Slavic. Uh, later on and so these like conquerors were being assimilated soon so bulgarians looked like any other any other slavic army of those times and uh they once bulgarians were defeated so byzantines could claim and restore their power again maybe i again move it like this okay so you can see it uh uh, the guy who, or the emperor who managed to restore it, was called uh, Vasil, just like my grandfather. But now this is Greek name Basileos. Basileos means the wise one, and shortage for English is called Basil. Basil the second, living in this around 1000, so many years after the fall of Great Moravia. So he managed to defeat uh, defeat uh, Bulgarians, couple of battles for which he. Um, was given a nickname typical for kings of middle ages and this was pretty like an interesting bulgar or bulgaro ktonos bulgaro ktonos ktonos means the killer the slayer yeah so basil the second basilos bulgaro ktonos this means the basil of the second the bulgar slayer Čiže Bulharobíca, tak to my nazývame, alebo vrah Bulharov, zabijak Bulharov. Actually, he defeated Bulgarians a couple of battles, and in this last one, Battle of Kladion, in 1014, uh, they managed to cap like 15,000 prisoners, and uh, to show Bulgarians that they should not resist Byzantine power, uh, he ordered to pick up uh, uh, every 100 men, that was stuck one of the eyes. This is one of lucky them. So he was left with one eye, but the others were blinded. All of them, like 99. So from these 15,000 prisoners, there was like 1,500 guys with one eye only. And he was left to lead those old blind men back home to Bulgaria. So all generation was just like defenseless and it was kind of a warning for their sons and other countries to see them all the time, this blind man, not to resist their Byzantine power. So this was interesting, and Basil II, one of the guys who restored Byzantine power. Okay, well, during these times, uh, at the, like the, during the 10th century, in the times of Basil II, they also managed to have very important uh, political and religious alliance and those alliance with uh, Kivan Rus it was kind of logical after their uh, uh, spreading uh, Byzantine church in Great Moravia at least at time because it failed what happened the Kivan Rus will later became become the successor of Eastern Orthodox Church in the future because one day Byzantine Empire fell you know and who took it over was Tsardom of Moscow or um, Grand Duchy of Moscow that would later be called Tsardom of Russia according to early medieval realm of Kievan Rus this is actually the temple in Kiev in Ukraine this is one of temples in Greece or Bulgaria, I'm not sure, but typical of this Orthodox Byzantine style. The point is that when Prince Vladimir, uh, the ruler of Kievan Rus in Kiev, he decided to leave, to abandon the faith, the religion of his grandfathers with Perun, Svanto, we learn about these gods. And he, from a couple of monotheistic religions, he was deciding about Islam, about uh, Judaism, about Latin, Roman Catholic Church, and Greek Orthodox Church of Byzantines. Uh, there is actually a nice story about this, and I'm not going to tell you right now, but because of vodka and pork, sauce and bacon, he decided to accept this Byzantine Eastern Orthodox Church. The other uh, advantage was that there had been already an alphabet that Christian, Christian books could be uh, translated in Slavic language of these Kievan Russians, 
and the letters were invented by uh, Constantin and Methodius one century before that. So for that reason, not only there was this <laughs> permit, uh, uh, they were tolerant to alcohol and pork meat, but also they could use this alphabet, which this is called Cyrillic alphabet. So in this way, they start with Christianization of Rus, and that's why even this temple, like many others in Ukraine and Belarus and Russia later on, were actually copies of Byzantine style with cupolas or these like uh, onion shaped uh, rules typical for them. Also they adopted the double crosses or even triple crosses. They were typical for Byzantine Empire of those times with double headed eagle, uh, double cross, maybe even ours, we are not sure about this. What else? Uh, Varangian guards. <laughs> this is another thing that from Kievan Rus came guys who were original Swedish Vikings. We learn about them and as famous warriors they became a tradition for Byzantine emperors to be hired as their bodyguards, personal bodyguards. And before that Byzantine missionaries had spread the Christian Orthodox faith in Great Moravia. So that's called Saint Constant Methodius. Uh, but they were banished by Prince Svetopluk of Moravia our great ruler, and they, their uh, disciples, Žiaci, učenici, keep their glagolic, or later on called Cyrillic alphabet, a bit easier, and they spread it in Bulgaria, uh, around Macedonia, in Croatia, Serbia, and from here, thanks to Vladimir and Byzantines, even to Kiev and Rus. So you can see that this is reason why we are not the green cow of Cyrillic alphabet, but Latin alphabet as other Western and Central Europe. Countries like Bosnia or Serbia had like mix, they use both of the alphabets. But you see that it is interesting. For, for that reason, this is an, uh, Cyril and Methodius uh, bringing letters. And actually many Bulgarians or Ukrainians uh, don't know that they never actually probably visited those lands. And they invented or created the, this alphabet for somebody else. That was Great Moravia here in Slovakia and Czech Republic. Okay, uh, so this is also that thanks to this, uh, Eastern Orthodox Church spread it even after the fall of Byzantine Empire uh, after 15th century, of course, dominantly in Russia and Balkans, and thanks to it even to Central Asia. And with diaspora of Russians, of Slavic peoples all around the world, you see that in this map from Wikipedia, uh, there is actually a number of population, uh, of percentage. So, for example, in Canada, by 5% of population in Canada are Eastern Orthodox uh, believers. In USA, by 1% at all. So this is in Australia, again, like about like 5% of people are descendants of Greeks or Russians, Ukrainians, maybe Slovak Russians, and so on. Okay, what else we had? Uh, of course, after this great East-West or Eastern schism, there were many years of these conflicts, and what I told you, and actually I did tell you about this, Sorry, uh, division of uh, uh, conflict. So it is written that Patriarch and the Pope excommunicated each other. So the division of Christianity to Roman Catholic and Eastern Orthodox or Slavic Pravoslavni uh, came to be. You cannot see this word in here, but try to small make it smaller, but still probably cannot see it. Cesaro Papism. Okay, I will copy it for you. So Papism and put it somewhere. I don't know, for example, here. So you can see it in here, at least like this, Cesaro Papism. What does it mean? Caesar Papism, uh, Caesar Papism uh, was typical feature of Byzantine Empire. Okay. Uh, typical feature of Byzantine Empire of uh, the thing that... Uh, because Patriarchos didn't possess so much power as the Pope in the West, so he was always chosen by the emperor himself. He was not result of election process among the bishops and archbishops, just like it was in the West. But here in the East, uh, that it became typical that uh, Patriarchos was always dependent on the on this emperor. If they change it, so I proclaim my cousin, for example, because he can support me. This is very important thing because. This Caesar Papism turned less from Byzantine Empire even to Moscow, to Russia. So for that reason, Tsars of Russia became like the guys who were ruling. So like in this picture of Byzantine Empire, you have this Byzantine Emperor, but around him bishops and patriarchos are uh, guys 
beneath him. Uh, we will deal with this thing that even, <coughs> sorry, similar conflict was there in, <coughs> pardon me, uh, I should stop recording this lesson. So uh, these guys uh, were actually behind him. It, in the West, they also had a conflict, but the Pope prevailed, he won. But the result is that even in Soviet Union, uh, and during communist times, uh, Eastern Orthodox Church was kind of like subjected even to communists. And <coughs> for that reason, again, the guy you have in Patriarchos of Moscow, of Eastern Orthodox Church generally, is Vladimir Putin. And he's the one who decides about this. <coughs> Sorry for my bad cough, guys. I should probably move on. So I will check uh, the time. Okay, 15 minutes. So probably... We are not going to go forward to Francia, in my opinion. So what do we have in here? During the 11th century, we got very important invasion of first of two Turkish uh, nations. These guys were called Seljuk or Seljuk Turks. These guys... <coughs> Sorry for that, guys. Uh, these guys came from uh, nowadays territories of Turkmenistan and Azerbaijan. So from the territories around the Caspian Sea. And they uh, organized huge invasion to the northern territories of uh, Byzantine Empire across Armenia. And uh, what a big surprise for many uh, people was that they defeated Byzantine excellent armies in the Battle of Manzikert of 1071. This big painting celebrating, of course, Turkish painting celebrating their excellent victory when uh, Byzantines are being already in shackles and the leader with Roman helmet, which is not correct, of course, not historically accurate. Subjected, defeated, and their power uh, caused that Seljuk Turks actually occupy all these green lands of Byzantine Empire. So all Middle East, uh, even Arabs, lost these territories to Seljuk Turks, and all Anatolia. What is interesting, Seljuks felt like, yeah, we conquered the territories of Romans, of Romanoi. So they proclaimed that their <coughs> emir would not be emir like the prince, but be, will be sultan. That is mean emperor for them. But still, they call it that, like the Seljuk Sultanate, and they call it Sultanate of Rome, which in Turkish language is Rum, in here. But in Latin, of course, in English it will be Rum. So it's not like rum drinkers, <coughs> not at all, as Muslims were, of course, uh, uh, strict uh, non drinkers, but they established this Sultanate of Rum. That would be very important because even Byzantines were threatened by them. And even for Arabs, they were like enemies. And these both things caused that uh, Byzantine Emperor asked his actually enemies, arch enemy, the Pope from Roman Catholic Church for help against Seljuk Turks. And as a um, pretense, I told him that, you know, Jerusalem, the place, the holiest place of Christianity is in the hands of Muslims. And Pope, yeah, why? why? So let's organize crusade. Actually, that was a big surprise, but it was like they, it, it had been for like four centuries, like even more. So that was interesting thing. For so that reason, like 20 years later, a new emperor, Alexios I, uh, asked the Pope for help against the Turks. And Urban II at the time, who was the Pope, he really organized a big council for which he invited not only bishops and archbishops, but even nobility and even like plebeians, like peasants. And then he gave a speech to all the crowds in which he said that, yeah, we have Jerusalem occupied by pagans, by heathens, so we should go there and deliberate it for the, for the glory of Jesus. And everybody who attends it, attends this crusade because they were painting crosses on their uniforms, on their armors. So you'll be, uh, you'll be forgiven all the sins you have committed in your lifetime, so you'll go to heaven. 100,000 people joined the first before the first crusade, like peasants of famous crusade, which was complete failure. But later on, the, the other, a lot of nobility and noblemen from like early, not early uh, already, but already uh, high medieval armies of noblemen from Western Europe march, march along the Danube River down to Byzantine Empire, where they were uh, invited by Alexios 
<coughs> despite they had to promise kind of oath of loyalty to him, like to become vassals, they just respected it because they didn't like them. They were angry that actually they suppose Muslims and Eastern Orthodox Christians complete the same thing. No, no reason, the same enemies. So once they start to claim some of the territories of Seljuk Sultanate that a bit shrinked a bit, so they managed to deliberate and they gave actually independence to Armenian kingdom of Kilikia in here and uh, with establishment of Antio the conquering of Antiochia and then Jerusalem they established their own crusader stage with a four and we will learn about them. Actually these crusades and differences between Greeks, Byzantines and Franks as generally not only Arabs but even Byzantines call all Western uh, Roman Catholic nations, they call them Franks. In very Hungarian Slovaks were Franks because we were using Latin alphabet and we had Catholic religion. So we were Franks. Uh, it caused a lot of conflicts and those conflicts actually came up during the Fourth Crusade when uh, Crusaders were forced to attack some of the Christian uh, territories uh, by their people who transported them. That was the Republic of Venice, uh, Benatki, who uh, uh, crusaders rented the, all their navy to transport the crusaders from the sea. While they were sailing across the Adriatic Sea, Venetians just pulled sails up and told and uh, told crusaders, "We are not going to proceed unless you conquer for us this port." But this is Zadar, Croatia, Kingdom of Hungary, our allies, Christians, Catholics say, "We don't mind. It is concurrence for us." So Crusaders had no other chance, possibility, only to attack, storm the town. And actually in Zadar they found so many treasures and loot was so great, they didn't mind it at, uh, at all. <coughs> then Venetians repeated again in Aegean Sea, somewhere near Crete, say, you know, our biggest concurrence is Constantinople. So attack it for us. And now Crusaders were not resisting, but actually the Crusades started to help Byzantines. But I said, yes, because they are Greeks, they are Orthodox, they're different Christians. They're actually worse enemies for them than pagans, heathens or Muslims. So for that reason, for that reason, all these Venetian navy, they had excellent battleships with like uh, towers on the ships and falling ladders and, and bridges and, and catapults on their ships. So they were able to attack and storm Constantinople even from sea. And uh, with such large armies of crusaders, they're able to climb and cross the across the fortification attack the town so in these pictures you'll see how they're actually climbing storming the town even uh, byzantines were surpri so surprised that they didn't raise their chains quickly enough so many ships got here and actually just climbed the walls using the ladders and so on now these uh, victorious uh, uh, crusader nobleman they didn't proceed to holy land to jerusalem they said yeah we managed to claim our new lands in here so let's spread latin roman catholic church in our lands but because there was not one king but there were many princes and dukes so they divided <coughs> i'm really sorry for that uh they decided to divide empire among themselves so that's where a couple of states that were actually Byzantine, but they ruled by Latin, Frankish, French, Italian, German noblemen like Despotate of Epirus, Principality of Achaia, Duchy of Archipelago, the Kingdom of Cyprus, Kingdom of Thessalonica, Latin Empire, či Latinské císarstvo, Empire of Nicaea. Empire of Trebizond. All these states were actually former Byzantine Empire divided among Western Christian Crusaders. And they, uh, these Latin kingdoms, as we call them, with different armor already, but all, again using the, some of these Byzantine symbols, survived until mid of the uh, now about like 50 years or 40 or 50 years. So very quickly, because probably I'm running out of time, yeah, seven minutes, so that would be perfect for Byzantine Empire only for this topic. Uh, Greeks actually managed to uh, claim it back, uh, claim it back. And what happened? <clears throat> Firstly, uh, in, by the 13th century, these Crusaders state were gradually defeated and reclaimed by Erez, by Caliphate of Baghdad, of this Abbasid Empire. 
another thing that even Sultanate of Rum was weakened by invasion of Mongols. And this huge empire, the biggest in the world history, will be so decisive uh, winner against not only our Hungarian army, but also against this Sultanate of Rum. So, at the time, uh, Greeks or Byzantines had enough power to concentrate it against pulling down this occupation of Latin Western noblemen who either got assimilated gradually or were just banished, you know. So Constantinople was reclaimed by Greek-speaking Byzantine dynasty or house of Palaiologos. Palaiologos as like tongue breakers, these Greek modern names of Manuel Palaiologos actually restored Byzantine power for a while at least. They didn't manage to have all the territories as they had been before, but for a while they claimed like half of Anatolia, parts of Balkans. Still, they didn't manage to have it all because uh, there were many other wars. Uh, uh, this is, I have to check it, it's Ottoman, okay. But uh, during the 14th century, there had a lot of civil wars, you know, every like cousin or second cousin claimed the throne, fighting, like really Game of Thrones of this. But there was another war against Bulgarians and later against Bosnia-Herzegovina. And finally, the, 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 well, the last Balkan Slavic kingdom of Stepan Dusan I was Tsar of Serbia. They proclaimed that they were Tsars. Even Bulgarians had proclaimed Tsardom already in the, in, the, in the ninth century, but these attacks of Serbians were really crucial and Byzantines couldn't defend properly. So Serbians invaded almost like deep inlands of Greece and it devastated empire. So when very small emirate of uh, a guy who was called Osman from these Turks uh, that were not called Seljuk Turks was established in the city of Burza, like only like 100 kilometers south of Constantinople, from this very small city-state, they grew into a huge empire and claimed all the lands of Byzantines. Only Constantinople remained like uh, the capital and was besieged. So this picture from uh, Osprey Publishing House series, Men at Arms, really popular books. You can see it in every big uh, bookshop. Uh, talking about like this Ottoman or Turk Ottoman soldiers in here. So this is a thing that as you see Osman in here, very small territory and many of some Turkish guys uh, having their own territories because Byzantine Empire was weakened by civil wars and this invasion of Serbians. <coughs> What happened? By this 1450s, Ottoman Empire, this Osman Empire, Ottoman Empire of Turks, uh, invaded territories of Anatolia and even in the Balkans, defeated Bulgaria, for example, pushed Serbians to the north. And at that time, actually, they even occupied Serbia uh, and uh, they were fighting against the Kingdom of Hungary in Danube, in Wallachia. And still the capital city Constantinople was there until 1453. Uh, which uh, during which finally uh, Mehmed the Conqueror, uh, great Sultan of Ottoman Empire, decided to conquer this, conquer this town. He came with his uh, 80,000 army and uh, stormed the city. Actually, the city uh, was really mm, with small population, only help of Pope and Venice. What a paradox of history. Was willing to help them with some of mercenaries from Spain, from Kingdom of Castile. Uh, Almogovars, they were so called, and together like 9,000 only soldiers were fighting in here after two month see, two month siege, 80,000 army and artillery of Ottoman Sol Mehmed II conquered and sacked the city. Most of Christian population was annihilated and it was given a new name, Istanbul. The seat of Patriarchal, so this is one of the pictures of storming the gates that survived for 1000 years. The seat of Patriarchos, the head of Eastern Orthodox Rite, was also moved to Moscow. This is a picture of celebrating arrival of Sultan. Some of the guys in here are the members of Johannes tribe. You cannot see because of my face. Some of the bishops. Some of the bishops and patriarchos himself, he managed to escape. And despite officially Turks proclaimed that yeah, you can be here, but these guys, uh, these patriarchos, Constantinople really didn't possess any power and any administration power about Orthodox countries in Bulgaria, Ukraine, and so on. For that reason, it was moved to Grand Duchy of Moscovy, which will be city of Moscow. And for that reason, these guys had the right to 
appoint bishops and archbishops okay even in pressure for example for this uh thing so this is interesting thing and of course uh, some pictures in here. This is legendary huge cannon that was actually built by a Hungarian blacksmith called Urban and he bring it to Byzantine Empire for the defense of Constantinople. But when he asked money, they realized that they don't have so much money. So he got angry and he offered it to Mehmed II. So even for because of this uh, huge cannon, they were able to storm and bring down the walls of Constantinople from this side. The other many things were how they were pulling ships over the mountains to get to the bay of golden horn uh, like vikings and it was really a huge thing so who would win some of the memes in here sabaton needs to sing about the fall of constantinople and uh many other stuff okay what do we have from byzantine empire i need to check it out guys okay last minute so perfect timing for me Christianity, this Eastern Orthodox Christianity, architecture typical for Eastern Europe, icons still used in all Central, Euro Central Europe, even today in East Slovakia. Administration, we call it Byzantine administration, I can tell you that so much bureaucracy, administration in the offices, uh, we have from Habsburg monarchy, Habsburgs have it from Ottomans and from Byzantines. Just like Romans, you need a paper for everything and stamp for everything. But thanks to this, Byzantines were able to rule and manage, especially in their military and law, their empire for 1000 years. Probably we, without this, without this bureaucracy and law, <clears throat> they didn't have great rule control about their lands, great military that could survive for 1000 years. Despite, I told you about many defeats, but they were crucial ones. But Byzantines most of the time were winning and defending the territories fiercely. Still, Constantinople was the end of the Silver Code. There was business and trade between Europe and Asia. One, Ottomans claim it and stop this trade. Europeans had to find new way, uh, new road to, uh, to Asia. And it was around sailing around Africa with age of discoveries. So this is actually the end uh, with some funny, funny memes in here with some videos about Byzantine military and John Green video. We are not going to watch it. Maybe, maybe next year and so on. Okay, what is in here? You're laughing because I just fell and you're laughing. Okay, so this is these are the parts. Next lesson, guys, we're moving to Frankish Empire and then we'll move to Slovak lessons about Slavic people in Slovak language. Okay, z mojej strany teda dětska je to všetko, takže děkuji vám za pozornost, no a prajem vám pekné dní. Stay negative and pleasant, positive in mind. Bye-bye.